And thank you to the Inclusion Solutions team for allowing me to be part of today and being in front of you all here. And thank you to everyone else that's here because, as Chris said, it's amazing to see so many people wanting to make a difference in their community. Trying to connect everyone else is, is a big part of how people can really understand what they're capable of doing. And you've heard a bit about my achievements, which is great, and I'm very proud of them. But today it's not about that. It's not about what I've done, what medals I have, although I'm always a bridesmaid, always a silver medalist, never the gold. But we'll, we'll, we'll get away from that. Today, it's about the journey. It's about identifying certain things, about finding opportunities, about opportunities being presented to you. And I'm gonna share you a little bit about that. But firstly, you heard that I have a disability. Obviously, being a Paralympian, I have to have a disability. So Denver, back up here, mate. He's getting worried now. Look at him, he's nervous. Definitely wasn't expecting this. Do, do you trust me? Mostly. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jump right in, mate. Sure. Okay, so I want you to just do the actions that I ask you to do for me, okay? Facing the audience, please. Hold your left hand out, palm down. Okay, now can you rotate your hand as fast as you can? Rotate it as fast as you can. Come on, faster, you can do it faster. You're a bowler, mate, come on. <laughs> okay, now open the hand up. One finger after another. Good. Good. So now on the right hand, can you do the same thing? A faster one. Your right hand, right? Yeah. yeah. Look at that. So much. Look at that go. Yeah, yeah. Look at that go. Now, same thing with the fingers. Good. Oh. Both hands out. Rotate as fast as you can together. Faster. Come on. <laughs> now, now do the fingers thing. Okay. Cool. Yep. Cool. Now, lastly, both hands up in the air. Wave to the audience. Say that again. Wave to the audience. <laughs> hey guys. You gotta wave back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let's go down to the feet. Left yep. foot. Yep. Foot out, rotate as fast as you can. Good. Nice. Right foot, can you do it? Both feet together. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Are you going to pick me up? <laughs> okay. Last thing. Last thing. This is always the hardest to do, but I, I believe that you can do it. Stand on the edge of the stage. Jump off. Turn around. Now backflip into the audience. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you very much, Denver. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Okay. Okay, now the reason I got Denver up on stage was I want to show you all how my disability affects me. So, as Denver did, first thing, hand out, rotate as fast as I can on the left. I think I'm faster than you on the left. Okay, yeah. And then doing the same thing with the fingers, no problem there. Left leg, can do all that, no problem. But if I go to my right side, I try to rotate as fast as I can. And if I do the fingers, I can do it but I've got to really concentrate. Come on, one more, one more, one more. There we go. Okay, cool. And then if I go to the leg, I literally have no rotation through that foot. I have a little bit of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, but it's all from the hip. Now, as you can tell, what side is my disability on? My right side, okay, cool. Does anyone want to have a guess at what my disability is? You can just shell it out. Cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy, thank you very much. So my next question is, What's wrong with me? Thank you. <laughs> That's always good to hear. I am a Dockers supporter, but... Um, <laughs> but this is, this is a perception. Whenever I had a conversation with someone, they would, always, they would always be quite open and honest, because to be honest, when you see me, you don't see my disability. I'm very fortunate. I do have red hair and freckles as well, but that lets me down sometimes. But most people are pretty good about it. However, there are times where I have conversations and as soon as I bring up that I have a disability or I'm a Paralympian, the next question is, so what's wrong with you? But that's, that's the mental mindset, that's a shift that we've, we've had as a society. It's groups like this that truly understand that a disability doesn't define who someone is. A disability doesn't change who you are. Sometimes it can be a detriment. Most of the times, to be honest, it can be an opportunity. Not just for the individual, but for the people in their lives as well. And see, when I was born, everything was normal. Everything was all good. I was three years old, and my folks, they were starting to question, why was Brad crawling more than walking? Why did he choose to do that? So they took me to a physio. And straight away, the physio said, your boy has cerebral palsy. And to be honest, my parents became so scared, they were shocked. They didn't know how to bring up a kid in this world with a disability. My dad was an army man. 
He was in the army for nine years and he was tough, he was strong. Now all of a sudden he's seen his boy as being someone who's fragile. Because they didn't understand, they didn't know how cerebral palsy was going to affect the rest of my life. Thankfully, although they had their initial shock and the confusion, they started to do everything that they could to try to make sure that my disability wasn't going to be an excuse for my life. My dad would stretch me for half an hour every day. He'd pull me inside early. My two brothers would be playing outside, having fun, and I'd have to come in early and do some stretching. My dad actually built me a box at 15 degrees to put up against, so I had to stand up against the wall. The box was like this, I had to stand on top of the box. And the whole thing was trying to push my heels down because for those, like I showed you with my foot, I really have no movement at all through that foot in terms of that sort of a up and down motion. So it was all to build that, but also the length of my leg because when I was younger, my leg on my right side was four centimeters shorter. And so this helped my body understand that it had some growing to do on the right side. And it was things like that that really provided me with the opportunity to be who I could. Now, my parents loved sport. My parents were sporty people, which is great, because sport was my passion. All I ever wanted to do was wear a baggy green to become the next Adam Gilchrist. Now, come on, you should know who Adam Gilchrist is. If you don't, read up on him. He's Australia's best ever wicketkeeper batsman. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, thank you. Denver's a mad cricket guy, so I can always rely on him. And oh, I just wanted to be Adam Gilchrist. But the older I got, the more I started to understand I had a disability. The more I started to get, to get told I had a disability. The more I started to get put outside because I had a disability. I started getting selected last on teams. People started calling me names. I had names like Cripple. Um, one of them was quite inventive, but Limp Biscuit because of my limp. Um, and I had red hair, so I won't get into it. But, but when kids want to make fun of someone, they can be quite inventive. And although it's just words, when you don't have self-belief, it can be quite detrimental. And I really struggled with self-belief. Self-belief was something that I found very hard to find. I had others in my life, my family, those that are close to me trying to help build me up, but I had to make that next step. Sport was the only way where I felt like I could justify my worth to society. It was a thing that I felt passionate about. It was a thing that I felt like I could do better than most. Let's fast forward now to when I was 16 years of age. I loved playing football, loved playing cricket, loved playing any sport. Outside, I didn't care what it was, I'd play it. I was playing able-bodied football, or just your mainstream football, and my teammates did a stupid thing. They named me captain of the team. I'm not a leader. No way in the world was I a leader. I couldn't even last a quarter of the game. I think the reason they named me captain was I never shut up. I could just bark waters the whole game. So that was going to be the way. But I thought, okay, if I'm going to be a leader now, I need to start leading by example. So what's one thing that I can control that I need to improve on? And that was fitness. I couldn't even last a lap on the track, so I started to run more laps. Within a couple of months, I went from a guy who couldn't even finish 400 to a guy who could run 10K. Now, it wasn't the fact I couldn't run 10K, it was the fact that I never actually applied myself. Once I started to apply myself, I started to realize, okay, Brad, you can actually start to do these things. Fast forward two more years, and this kid who was very vulnerable started to have a little bit more confidence, started to stand a little bit taller, started to show his worth to the community, because all of a sudden I was seen as being someone who he was normal. My dad seen in the paper, the Australian Paralympic team had a talent search day. They had a talent search day in Bunbury, of all places. First time it's ever happened. My dad said, Brad, let's go. Who knows what you can do? I said, no, I'm not good enough. No way in the world will I be good enough to ever be a Paralympian. But deep down, the reason I didn't want to go was this was for people with disabilities. I didn't want to be known as one of those people. I've worked my whole life to not be someone with a disability. I wanted to be over here with everyone else. I didn't want to be over here standing in a box with people with disabilities, getting looked down on, going, OK, we'll just give them a shot. I'll have some fun. I didn't want to be known as one of those, so I didn't want to go. Thankfully, thankfully, my dad forced me to go. He literally threw me in the car and w walked me in there and signed me up. I walked into this gymnasium. I just remember looking up. And there was people in chairs, people with walking sticks, people with all different types of equipment that I've never seen before. And I was 12 years old again. I felt so vulnerable because I'm like, I'm not one of these people. I'm not one of them. And that was my belief. That was how I was brought up. It wasn't anything to do with my parents. It's just because that's what 
my school life, that's what everyone else around me externally, that's the environment people were creating. The people with disabilities had to be over here. I didn't want to be over there, I wanted to be here, as I said. But the greatest thing happened that day was they started off with the beep test, and for those that know the beep test, it's quite punishing. It's just up and back running. How long can you last? And it gets faster and faster and faster. I finished the beep test, and uh, they said, Brad, you've just broken the record for the beep test. How would you like to go to Canberra and train at the Australian Institute of Sport for a week, see if you like athletics? So I gave it a shot, and they said, hey, would you like to come back on scholarship? So I moved to Canberra six months later. This is a kid from Bunbury who grew up with everyone telling him he wasn't good enough. There's a few people that told me I was, but it was mostly telling me I wasn't good enough. So now being at the center of excellence for sport in our country, that was my dream. All of a sudden, my disability, the place that I didn't want to be, in the bubble that I didn't want to be in, was now my opportunity to become potentially a representative for Australia. For the next 18 months, I worked tirelessly with my coaches, with support staff, with my family, to try to qualify for the Beijing Games. I did that. I took 12 seconds off my time in 800 in 18 months to then qualify for Beijing, where in front of 90,000 people, a kid that was ranked probably eighth or ninth in the world, finished second and won a silver medal. Now, that's pretty cool, right? It's great, and like I said, I'm not focusing on the performance or anything like that, but it's just to show that at the end of the day, I started to believe in myself more and more, and then once I started to accept my disability, I started to become open to the opportunities that were there. When I was a kid, my parents had to create those opportunities for me. My dad had to do the things that I didn't want to do because I couldn't understand it. I couldn't comprehend what my disability was. He took that ownership, and he helped me, and my mum helped me to become the person I am today. If they didn't do that work then, there is no way in the world I would have ever made it to Beijing or anything else because they created that opportunity. Once I was old enough to start to understand what my disability was, I could then take ownership, and which I did. And I'm so thankful for that, because I, I see myself as a lucky person, and I do believe you have to make yourself lucky, you have to create lucky opportunities. But back then, I couldn't do any of that. The people in my life had to do that, and they did. Thankfully, they did. Unfortunately, not everyone has that. And that's what people like you are here to do. Go and help people become who they can be by providing sometimes that glimmer of hope, that opportunity that they can be better than what everyone else is telling them. Provide them with the opportunity to become the person that they can become. Now, through all my sporting journeys, I've had some amazing things happen. I've always aimed for gold. I've always wanted to be the best. And it took me a long time to understand that it, wasn't, that it isn't the result that's important, it's the process. Now, I'm hoping this works. We'll see if this works. To give you a bit of an idea, at the Rio Games in 2016, I was ranked two in the world again. I was expected to win silver, if not gold. I went into that race confident, although I did injure myself three weeks before, and the reason I'm telling you that is it will come up in a second, and I didn't sleep for more than probably two or three hours a night for three weeks, and I was in severe nerve pain through my whole good side, my left side of my body. But at the end of the race, the guy that was expected to finish second at worst finished sixth. I was embarrassed, I was upset, I just wanted to crawl into a ball and just feel sorry for myself on the track. But I realised those moments are important, those moments you can still have positive impact. And even though I was feeling like crap, I just wanted to get out there, I knew that I was going to have an interview with the media after that race. And I went through my head, okay, what are you going to say? Do I make excuses? No, I don't want to be one of those people that makes excuses. Because my whole life, it's been about creating opportunity. And there are going to be people at home watching me, wanting me to be the best that I can be, and they're supporting me. I don't want to go and make excuses in front of them. Even though I feel it internally, I feel like crap, I want to make sure that I can help them. So this is what happened. To all those kids back home with a disability, your disability doesn't have to be your excuse. It can be your greatest opportunity. Just like out here, you guys need to get out here because this is amazing. So don't use that as an excuse. Use it as an opportunity. Become a Paralympian and do yourself any country proud. And thank you to everyone back home. So that was my interview after my race. It's cool, right? Like it's 17 seconds, I said a few words. That's not what it's about. What it's about is the messages I received after that. I had parents emailing me, messaging me on Facebook, commenting on the video saying, this video has been amazing, well this interview is amazing, my kid is now running around the land and pretending to be Brad. My kid has CP and he wants to be a Paralympian. 
that was the worst result I have ever achieved. But that interview afterwards had a greater impact to that any medal or anything would have ever done. Because what that did was I utilised that opportunity to make sure that I left a positive impression at trying to motivate people to become the people that they can become. And that's what that was all about. That video had 80,000 views in two days. Again, that's cool, but the fact is I know single-handedly that at least impacted five people's lives because they've now found something that they want to do. Whether they pursue that or not, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that they've found something that motivates them internally that they want to go out there and be. Everyone should be able to have that belief that they can go out there and be who they want to be. Because self-belief, although I think it's underappreciated in a lot of ways, it's the most valuable thing we can ever possess. Because if we have self-belief, anything is possible. You take away self-belief, everything becomes harder. Because it doesn't matter what's happening in your life. If you have self-belief, you can go out there and you can make change. You can do the things that you want to be. Because people can tell you no, but if you believe in it and you want to achieve it, you can still go out there and do it. Now, which brings me to retiring after Rio. I wanted to do for other people what everyone has done for me. They created a life for me to be able to become the best person that I can. I had people that believed in me even when I didn't. I had people that would support me and do the things that I didn't want to do to help me to get to where I wanted to be. Now, that's why I want to do the same. I started coaching back home in Bunbury. I started doing things to help out other people in Bunbury. I wanted to give back to the community that gave so much to me. And then I had an opportunity through APM, Advanced Personnel Management. Um, for those that don't know, they've received the contract to roll at the NDIS through most of WA. And on that, there are a few people in throughout the state, about 30 of us, that are called Community Capacity Builders. Basically, of sorts, we're almost like an inclusions officer. We go out there and we have conversations with people with, with disabilities and find out What's missing out there? What are the things that they want to do that they are struggling to achieve? What are the things that are missing in the community? What are the things that need to be improved in the community? What are the conversations that need to be had? Who are the people that we want to link? These are the things that I wanted to do when I came back home and there was a perfect opportunity through IPM. And now I get to go and do what I love. I get to go and do those things and help people like I said that just helped me. And that, is that coming around full circle or what? Like, how amazing is that? How amazing is that I get to do that as a role now to help the people, to help the community that helped me out so much. And although, yes, I am resource to do it, that's where it's so good to see so many people in here that want to make that change as well, that want to be in the community and help out. Because the more people that do that, whether it's on a volunteer role or it's your paid opportunity, that's what we need as a community. We need people going out there and, as Chris said, being proactive, being approachable, willing to go out there and sometimes doing the things that we don't want to do because it's what the community needs, if that makes sense. Like I know my dad, I'm just gonna, this last thing I'm gonna say, but this last thing I'm gonna say, but it's pretty important. I remember I played cricket and we started at 8.30 in the morning. My dad was working shift work and this is the thing you never appreciate as a kid. He would work from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., get us kids ready for cricket, take us out to cricket, go all day, 12.30, we'd go home, and then we'll go outside for a kick, he'd come out with us, make dinner, and then he's off to work and he didn't sleep. These are things as kids you don't appreciate, but he was doing things he didn't want to do, but he wanted to be there for those good moments as well. He could have easily said, no, nah, I'll get someone else to take you boys to cricket, I'm going to have a sleep. But that's what was so amazing. Like, and this is my father, so that's why I'm very fortunate to have people like that in my life. But this is what people in community can do. Those things that sometimes we don't want to do to help the community be the best that it can be, or even an individual. So I know I've probably gone over time, and I do apologise for that. But I just want to say once again, thank you to Inclusion Solutions. Thank you to everyone for being here. And thank you for allowing me to, to share my story with you. And um, hopefully, let's go and make some more positive impacts in the community. So thank you very much.